name is Adam. I am uh, the uh, software st uh, engineering student here at McGill. I'm also the Google Developer Student Club lead uh, for, the, for the McGill chapter. And uh, uh, today we're, we're having a panel, uh, Tech Connect, that your questions are answered. And our panelists here will, will be uh, kind of answering your questions. They're, they're all professionals in the industry. And uh, we, we hope they'll be able to, uh, to, to help you out in your career path. Um, hi everyone, so my name is Alexa and I'm a student at McGill in Computer Science and Biology and I'll be hosting the panel with Adam today. Um, we have a bunch of great speakers in the industry here today and we really hope you can get insight from them and ask them all your questions and um, Adam will be going over the agenda. Yeah. So we'll do a, a very quick five minute introduction where everyone's uh, kind of talking, like uh, presenting themselves and uh, mentioning kind of their, their career, what, 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 they, what they're doing. Um, and then we're going to go to a topic-driven Q&A for most of the session, 40 minutes, uh, where we're going to go one topic at a time. And uh, we'll, have a, we'll, we'll have a few prepared questions, but if you have any questions, we'll have a Slido link that you can all scan. And uh, you can ask your questions there, vote on other questions, uh, kind of like so that you can voice whatever you want to, to ask to the, the panelists. Uh, after that, we'll do a full just audience Q&A for 10 minutes, and then uh, our closing remarks at the end. So, with that, uh, so introducing our panelists, we'll start with Julia first. Thanks. Um, hi, my name is Julia Simon. Um, I worked in the tech world for many, many years, and I was. Um, I started in marketing, um, I'm on the softer skill side, and then I found um, community, an open source community, and that was really where my, um, I guess my expertise sort of evolved there. Um, so I was the organizer of many events in Montreal, um, and now I do freelance work, and uh, my involvement in the tech world now revolves around um, data for good. Um, so I found kind of a different way to be involved in the tech space that felt a little more aligned with my heart and my values. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Hello, I'm Stefania Pecore, and uh, I, um, I'm an NLP consultant, but I'm also a senior data scientist in the video game industry. Um, so my background is uh, very weird because I started with uh, uh, linguistics, and uh, a bachelor in uh, foreign languages and literature, and then I moved into the computational linguistics. I learned more or less to code, and then I basically um, had um, a path uh, in, in, uh, in the research setting, and then I moved into the video game industry. And right now I'm a, I'm a data scientist and I'm involved in many projects uh, that have different uh, type of data. And I'm also the responsible one for the NLP part. And I'm very happy to be here today. I hope to reply to your questions. Right, for those who were here before, yeah, it's me again. Uh, so, I, Stacey Veranos, I'm a senior pre sales slide engineer at SADA. I'm also a GDG Club Montreal organizer. Uh, background 27 years in tech, uh, started as a developer and ended up in sales. I don't know why. Uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, no, so like really like started coding stuff that the really people does not really use right now. Uh, really classic infrastructure went into, you know, building data centers. Jumping into open source with OpenStack, which is where uh, I actually ended up at CloudOps, where I was uh, working with Julia, uh, and also getting involved in the community. So OpenStack itself, OpenStack uh, meetups, OpenStack ambassador for Canada, and then just you know then jumping to the Google Cloud scene and um, you know helping with the GDG Cloud Montreal. But yeah, they're super happy to be here, and uh, I'll answer any question and give insights to anybody. So. Hi, so uh, my name is Huda Kadiwi. I also have um, what you'll call an unconventional background. It's not unconventional anymore. So my background is in medicine. I'm a medical doctor, and now I'm working as a data scientist in a biotech company. I am very involved in 
the community, the student community, and the woman tech maker with Stefania and a couple of other people here. I've been helping Stacy and then uh, left him alone for the GDG <laughs> Cloud. Uh, hopefully, we'll come back as well. Um, yeah, so uh, from medicine to tech, started learning to code slowly and then went into a master's, um, merging deep learning and medical imaging, and from there, going to industry and working on different, uh, different roles. Now we'll, we'll move on to the topic-driven Q&A. We'll start with the first topic. Um, <clears throat> but first, a Slido link. So if you want to kind of voice your question or uh, you see a question that another person has asked and you want to upvote it, you can, uh, it's all, uh, it's a web app. So uh, we can also send polls as well. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do Q&A for now. Um, all right, so our first section is on uh, the inspiration and, and journey of our, of our panelists. Um, so our, the question that we've prepared is, uh, were there any pivotal moments in, uh, or pivotal, pivotal moments or role models that inspired you to enter the tech industry? And this is for all the panelists, but if you want, can you one person? No, I'll go like this. Yeah. Right. Uh, pivotal moments. They the only, uh, honestly, like this is like when you know you want to do tech, but you don't know. I know that uh, I had like a circuit board suspended on my ceiling when I was a kid. So I was like, okay, so there's something there. Maybe not. So always wanted to do that, basically. So it just went in. But you don't really know where, what you want to do. So in terms of what's the journey, like what's the first job, like what leads you to your first job? Because, hey, that's actually what I want to do. Uh, you know, it comes with... The other people that you know, maybe some older people that are going down that path, say, oh, they started to code. Then you start to code, say, oh, it's cool, I can do stuff. Then at one point, you just you know, like move on and do some other stuff. Like you can say, oh, I can, I, I can actually like take care of servers. I can do this, this. There's a, there's a world that opens. Then you go to school, then you know, they show you 10%, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, and then you kind of discover the rest on your own. But it's, uh, yeah, the, the journey has been you know, like just basically like eat, sleep, drink, tech nonstop. That's what I do. So it's uh, the, the journey w w was that. It's just like finding those points where, oh, there's some new stuff that's happening. There's new stuff that's cool that I actually have interest. Oh, I could, like right now, it's like AI, for example. It's not super, uh, uh, it's everybody's talking about AI, but that's a, some, for some people, it could be a pivotal, uh, pivotal uh, point in their, uh, their journey, maybe. I'm doing dev, I'm doing tech, uh, maybe more classic infrastructure, but this thing is actually for me something that's interesting, that could be a pivot to bring you to something else. It's usually around like, what's the next step? Um, so in that journey, so yeah, that's for me. Um, for me, it was during medical school where I was looking everywhere and technology was everywhere and yet not in healthcare. Uh, so I started wondering why and realized quickly that a lot of tools are really cool, made by great engineers, but they did not involve the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare professionals while building them. And then they were just left on the side because they weren't answering the actual problem. So I wanted to be there. I wanted to bridge that gap of technology and medicine. Um, and it was clear for me that something was gonna happen in terms of more of a software that was gonna impact healthcare, either for good or for worse. Uh, so I you know, started to learn how to code, as I said, and then decided that I was gonna be part of that team that will translate the real problems and also try to do no harm on the technology side. Uh, being responsible, making sure patients are okay, uh, that the technology is built to be inclusive and all the other things that you already learned. But that was really the pivotal moment, seeing the lack of technology applied to healthcare for different reasons. Do you wanna add? Yeah. Well, uh, since we share the unconventional background, <laughs> uh, I can say that um, my Haha <laughs> moment was when I finally ended my bachelor. So um, 
I had a lot of knowledge about languages, uh, cultures, and literatures, but at some point I was like, okay, but what I can do with that? What if there are people over there that don't have done the same studies as me? How I can help them? And that's where I started to have, to, to meet basically AI and machine translation, and that was uh, basically my starting point for the journey. It was like, okay, so I can use uh, what I can do with a computer for what I learned during these years with the languages and the culture. I can basically, I mean, it was nothing new because in the 50s there were the journalists that were trying to do the same, but for me it was a surprise moment and uh, that was my, I can say my aha moment that started my overall journey from today. So a question that came up um, for Huda. Uh, do you think that you would have ended up at the same place if you had a more conventional path? Like if you just stayed in tech at first or if you just stayed in medicine at first? Mm. <laughs> if I, st if I had, I mean, I stay, um, sorry, can you say the sorry, last yeah, part sure. of? Yeah, so do you think you would have ended up in the same place if you had a more conventional path? Yeah, so I would not have been in the exact same place, meaning, you know, lacking one industry knowledge. Uh, I would have probably been better, um, a better software developer, but that's not exactly my spot in, like, the position where I am. So I, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think this was needed. Did I need the entire eight years of medical school? <laughs> probably not. Uh, but a big chunk of medical education was uh, required, yes. So the, the first question we have here, um, we can go through everyone at first. Uh, what specific skills helped you succeed in the tech industry? So we can, we can start with Stacey. Sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, <laughs> that's one of them. Um, I mean, like, like if, you're, if, you're, if you're, okay, like I have 28 years in IT, so I started, like it, everything changed this, uh, so. Um, what allowed me to like the, the balance was basically since I've mentioned like I, I just love tech. So if work is not work, but actually something you enjoy, it's kind of easy to go through. Uh, it's also easy to get lost to. Sometimes you'll pull in hours you're not supposed to, but in the end, if it makes you grow as an individual, kind of, I would say like for me, again, like this is personal, but like this is, this is kind of works. That's, I was able to get that balance of being able to work in something I actually love and be able to see myself grow in it by being within the right circles and targeting the right tech. So the kind of getting the right skills that fits where I want to be. And the fact, again, like the most important thing is that if you don't love what you actually work on, I would say like work on something else. <laughs> yeah. um, mine would, have, would be perseverance. But I also want to just comment on Stacy's uh, point, meaning you really need to love what you're doing, but also, and I don't know what this skill is, just realize that your job is a job, um, and kind of like being able to detach yourself to keep yourself a little bit sane. Uh, that's going to be important. Love it, in, get involved, you know, be 100% doing your work, but keep yourself as an individual independent from that job, um, whatever skill that is. Um, yeah, and actually that's a good one. I um, had a pretty significant burnout in 2019 um, and I had to take time off work and I had to reevaluate my whole perspective. So I would say that that's a good piece of advice. Um, my uh, Mine would be curiosity. I think it's a really underrated, um, I don't know if it's a skill, but it's a quality, I think. And I think it's something that, 
we're always talking about ourselves and it's really nice to ask people about themselves and it's really interesting to learn new things about new industries and new projects and different people um, and in the tech world it's easy to get caught up in the tech and to forget who we are as people um, and I think that that's something that's really important. Okay, so thank you for your replies <laughs> so that I need to have more replies but yeah so I agree with you and um, what I can add is uh, in terms of how you can also think about your job is that try to think about your job not to have a burnout but like it's a challenge that it can helpful for you to learn so use the job to learn new stuff and not for the job itself like so so that it's a challenge but it's a challenge with yourself so it, it will be more uh, manageable and for me I think that uh, also my superpower will be in, like I am uh, scared about a lot of stuff but I try always new stuff and I try not to be to have fear and I try not to compare to other people and to other paths I know that my path is unique and I, there are always keys that you can find for your path. And basically, you can always find a way to do what you want. And, and again, it's a challenge with yourself. So there is no rush, and uh, you will be 100% a winner in any case, because you will grow more and more. So there's a, a question that's coming up now, and it seems that uh, it, it was it's pretty popular. It's the uh, with the kind of uh, with AI become, becoming uh, very hyped, and all these new technologies coming around. Uh, how do you uh, do you just do you chase after all of these new skills because they're very exciting, or do you wait and do 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 take time to to learn the skill as uh, as you think it might be? impactful to your professional or personal life? Okay. Um, I can reply to this. Um, I mean, if you are a curious person, I think that the, the question will, will reply itself. Like, if you want to try it, try it without like uh, using a lot of time. Uh, just because you have the pleasure to try it, just to because you have the pleasure to see, okay, I know that model, but what what are the difference about those models too? And uh, of course, the fact that probably mm, like you can add uh, different model to say, okay, I am uh, more experienced in using those models, but I think the most important part is that basically you will be able to um, be flexible every time that there is a new model. Uh, so it's not the model itself, it's really how you will approach the fact that you will have always more models. Thank you. So the first question is for Stacy. Um, so how has evolving, involving yourself in the community helped you in your career? Well, yeah, well, that's, I would say like there's, there's, I don't see how I could have been like end up where I am right now without go, going through community. Like anything you can do, even like participating, like it's, it creates like, again, networking. It's the people you meet, the people you meet at a conference that you meet another conference and then you get to know each other. And at one point you don't know, like you say, hey, by the way, we have an opening for exactly your skill set. Want to come along? It's like you don't send a resume anymore. Like people actually knock on your door because you network, you meet people, and it just happened. Could be online. Of course, it's awesome to do that in person, um, but it, that's 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 a crucial piece. Like I couldn't be where I'm right now without that networking piece mm -hmm. and being able to, you know, say, oh yeah, like uh, like on the Google Cloud side of things and uh, like uh, like in Montreal, say, oh yeah, well, Stacy doing this, Googlers know me. But that's because I've put myself out there, but also because I've learned how to do it through seeing others doing the same thing. So yeah, that's, uh, that's how it helped, like really. Awesome, so that leads us to a more general question for everyone. Um, 
Do you have any tips on how students should network better and make stronger impressions when talking to professionals in the industry? Um, okay, so involvement in open source community is my is my jam, um, or was for a really long time, and I think that that's it ties into what Stacy is was saying. Um, and not everybody is an extrovert, and not everybody is this like you know, bubbly, going to talk to everybody all the time, but I think it provides a really nice way to learn new things, to meet people in a way that is comfortable for you, for whoever you may be. Um, there are so many different ways to get involved and um, be engaged, and it's you're, you're giving back, but you're also learning so much from it. So I think you're not... Um, yeah, like, and it ties into what we were talking about earlier, like where your interest is. So if you're interested, for example, in some open source technology, it might be something new, it might be something that's existed, um, or it may not even be actually open source, it may be closed, but either way, getting involved and building those relationships, I would say is probably a really great way to do it. Um, did you wanna add something, Huda? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add that I think when you think networking, you're thinking students with pr industry professionals, uh, but also network between yourselves because uh, in a couple of years you'll be working in different companies and then that network is important as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so there's a, a question here directed uh, towards Julia. Um, so in the or open source uh, tech communities in Montreal, like which ones would you recommend people get involved in? Or which ones? <laughs> oh God! <laughs> or, or, what is something that they can do to uh, to, to get involved? To get involved, yeah. So, kind of on the topic we were talking about before, the, the trends are always changing. So it's really hard, you know, what Stacey was saying, like AI is really hot right now, or you know, you can't be everywhere all at once. I think again, it has to start with your where your interests are. Um, I was involved in a lot of communities that were not specific to like a technology. So for example, DevOps Montreal. Um, I did a fair bit of work there, and what I liked about it is that it was a lot of different types of backgrounds. There were people from you know, the infrastructure side, there were developers um, using different technologies. Like it's, a, it's kind of a mishmash, but yet somehow there's still like a common ground there. Um, yeah, I think, I think the beauty of those is that everyone's there for the same reason. Everyone's there to learn, everyone's there to support one another, and everyone's there to have access to interesting f and free information. That's why we're there, we're there to, to share it. Um, so I don't know if I would like call out any specifically because that's a slippery slope and I might date myself. Um, but I think, yeah, look into like what meetups are happening. I mean, Google does a bunch of them. Um, DevOps does a bunch of them. DevOps Montreal. Um, I'm a bit out of that loop right now, but I think there are a lot of really cool and interesting events that are happening. Um, and again, like, just see what seems interesting. You know, you can go for an hour, and if that's not your vibe or it's not what you're looking for, cool. You can try something else. So I think it's just to be open-minded about it. Um, and yeah, you want to add something to that, Stacy? In terms of which communities, I mean, you were in OpenStack, so yeah, and, okay. and <laughs> I can talk about like, the, like, uh, like, yeah. So, if you look at, I would say like, I don't want to say like what's out there, but like, like the OpenStack community is still there, uh, still, it's still there. It's not as odd as it was. It's still there because there's a lot of telcos leveraging that. If you're actually looking at stuff that has to do with the telco realm, like maybe it's worth having a shot. Like the CNCF Kubernetes meetups are there, so if you want to go down that path, no problem. Of course, like there's the there's a Google one for for cloud or just like well, there's like Flutter and all that. So uh, there, they, honestly, like there's a lot out there. It's hard to just like pinpoint once. Like where should I start? Uh, but to your point, mentioning the like DevOps Montreal, those that are more generic will allow you to kind of shoot wider into your spectrum of like what's out there. And then maybe you can pick a few where you want to deep dive, and if they're online, like, it's just it's go in, check in, and, you know, check out, or just, like, wait for the recording and play it back at 2x, <laughs> and see what's what. Thank you, thank you very much. That was really helpful to, uh, to help
help students get engaged, and maybe I'm biased too, uh, in <laughs> GDSC McGill, but yeah, I think we've all, uh, we all uh, like the community aspect uh, of, uh, of being a developer. Um, we'll move on to the next topic now, which is uh, specialization and project showcase. So, um, how would you kind of give advice to students to find their specialization and then to kind of maybe uh, to follow it? I know you've all, you've all kind of gotten your specializations now, and so how would you <laughs> advise students? Find your specialization would be a mix of your interests. I think you need to be interested, that's for sure. But also being able, and that's, I, don't, I don't have an answer, but if you're just starting, looking where, what skills are missing in the market, um, where the technology is going is gonna help you choose. Probably internships are gonna play a big role in that because you'll see how, what's happening in the industry and the different sections or directions you can take. Uh, but go with interest as well. So yeah, I guess that's my... Uh, and uh, <coughs> so I think find your specialization. Uh, it, can be, um, it can be hard because you, you need to understand what are your interests, but you need also to understand uh, what will be your future. So how will you position it yourself in the market? So my suggestion would be, for example, to contact uh, people that are already working for a long time and ask them, what is your vision for the future? Uh, should I specialize more in uh, this domain or in that domain? And also uh, trying to be uh, practical. So internships are very useful because uh, you will have the part of your specialization that is theoretical, but then there is the practical part. How, what you learn is really used in a company. What are the, um, maybe the limitation that you will see or the things that you didn't expect and that you can also learn. Thank you. So we have a, a question directed at uh, Stefania. Um, so we'd like to know how has your graduate degree helped in your career? Interesting question. <laughs> um, so, I think it helped me personally because, uh, uh, however, um, be, being able to uh, go to the journey of a PhD means that there is, however, uh, some soft skill that you need to learn and uh, you need, however, to, uh, like, yeah, uh, have a perseverance and also a, a, a curiosity and also be involved in things that at first sight is, they are not so easy. Uh, so there is this personal aspect. You know that you will be always good uh, to learn new stuff. You, you know that no matter what you will encounter, you will find a way to learn it. Um, so in terms of professional, it depends. Sometimes, um, it helps, for sure, once you have already the job, because you can say, okay, however, with my PhD, I can tell you that I have some technical skills and I have also some soft skills that I can use to uh, have uh, uh, different roles in a company. And uh, especially, I can do what sometimes they are called the doer, but also I can also go in the, into the management of a project. So this helped me a lot. Uh, sometimes it can be hard because uh, you will maybe find some companies that they will tell you that having a PhD means that you are still a student and uh, they will find hard to recognize your skills. But that's however good for you because this means that basically maybe you can avoid those companies. Uh, <laughs> and so the point here is always you are the protagonist of your life. Uh, having a PhD, it's useful. It's useful, especially if you want to say in the research academy. It's not something that you need 100% if you want to have a job, uh, even if you are like, uh, if you want to, to, to become a data scientist as me, or if you want to become a manager or a director. There are a lot of uh, managers and directors out, out there that have not a PhD. 
but they have already all the skills that they have uh, to, to have the role. Uh, we'll move on to the next topic now, uh, challenges and resilience. So uh, this is directed to, to everyone. Um, were there any significant challenges that you encountered in your career uh, and how did you overcome them? Or maybe one specific instance of a, maybe a, a big challenge that, uh, that you face. Okay, I'll start with that. Um, I've had a few. Um, the first one, as I mentioned, was um, a burnout. It was not just related to work. It was sort of like a life burnout. <laughs> yes, that was a pretty big. Um, that was a pretty big setback because I really got caught up in this. Um, I think how society raises us to be high performers and to never stop and to never rest and to just like be really good at every single thing that we do all the time. Um, not sustainable, don't recommend it. Um, so I had to really reset sort of how I came, came to, to my life and to work um, and how I saw those things. Um, another challenge is layoffs. It's a hot topic these days in the tech world. Um, I was laid off in 2021 um, and that was really hard. Uh, it's really hard to be part of a team and a group and uh, a culture and then just all of a sudden to not be. Um, and one of the things that makes me passionate about being humane in the workplace is that most companies don't know how to lay people off or really deal with people um, very well. So that is something that I think is important to hopefully change and to realize we are dealing with humans who have feelings and you know, different realities. We all have different realities, one from another. Um, actually, yeah, so I think those would be my two biggest challenges. Um, yeah, anyone else want to add anything? Yeah. Challenge? Uh, Go for it. My first challenge was going from uh, grad school to industry. Uh, a lot of things happen. Uh, the pace is not the same. Grad school research is intense, but a different kind of intense from industry. Expectations are not the same. Your pace in research is still very slow, although you have to do a lot of work. And then you go to industry, and then everything had to happen yesterday. Um, and I wasn't prepared for that, because I came from a different path and never did any internships, so first exposure to industry. The other challenge was uh, glass ceilings. So you see a company with a lot of diversity, and you go in you're super happy because it's super diverse and then you realize every high level position is a white man. That was my case. And there, were, there was no way to go through it. I saw people there that have been there for years and they never you know, progressed. What I learned is if you see that, you leave. There's no, like, it didn't happen before, it's not gonna happen if you're not comfortable staying in the same position and you should not, uh, you should aspire to progress in your career, you have to leave. It's very hard because we all need a job. Um, so you need to find another job or just leave and look for it if you can afford. But these are the these were the two things that I uh, was faced that were surprising. Thank Anyone you else? Much. Awesome. So we have a follow-up question. Um, so what unique challenges do women face in ascending to leadership roles in the tech industry? And how can aspiring female leaders navigate these challenges effectively? I guess, I guess I just mentioned one. <laughs> um, another one is credibility, and it's sad to say we're 2023, and still um, women's credibility, you know, they, we, we need to make more efforts to be taken as seriously. I am very hopeful. I see the trend changing. Um, you'll be surprised it's not necessarily w from the new generation, which is sad, but it's the life. So... That's, that's uh, one major one, and again, it's gonna be company culture. When you interview, you kind of try to judge how it's going, try to ask around and see how are people, you know, all, all minorities, women or other, uh, treated different positions, and then, yeah, I guess that's, that's uh, one big one, I'm guessing. Other. Um. 
So I think uh, in my case, I, it, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. Um, I was a woman. I was the f first and only woman to work at the company where I worked um, for a, a long time, a year or two, I think, before the second woman was hired. Um, and I also came from a non-technical background, so I had I had a major inferiority complex. Um, so I, I felt like I had to work really hard. I was also um, the only mother because I was the only woman there. I was the only single parent. Um, so I don't think I was aware of it at the time because I just had to kind of get through, you know, stay afloat with what was happening. But um, I do think that it's it is more challenging for women. You're, you, we have to realize that we're the minority in this industry. Um, and I hope that that changes um, over time. And I hope that, yeah, it evolves because I think that's something that you have to be prepared for as a woman, that you're often gonna be the only woman in the room. Um, and so learning to navigate that. And for the men, um, or people who present as male um, and identify as such, um, be aware of that and be aware that it's, yes, we're equals, but it's not the same journey. Um, so support the women in your workplace or in schools and advocate for them and um, make space for them as well. Well, um I don't have a lot to add because basically you, you express exactly what I was thinking. Like, it's true that uh, however the journey is not uh, easy, we have this imposter syndrome. I think also like the imposter syndrome is, is a characteristic of, of, of the industry in general for the AI uh, since we have a lot of things that we need to learn very rapidly. Um, I see, however, compared to 15 years ago, the things are changing. I'm happy about that, but uh, for sure we need to see. Uh, we, we are still waiting for the big change. And uh, it's true that um, probably it's not only help uh, the woman or the women that you have in your team is uh, trying to see the other people as they are people. So try to see if they are struggling or if they have challenge and base what you can do uh, on that in general. Thank you, those are some really great answers. We'll move on to the next uh, topic here. So future tech and emerging Uh, so, in your respective fields, how do you see the future of tech evolving? I will start. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I will reply as I replied today during the talk. Um, I think that today we have the chance to introduce uh, easily people that are not tech into the NLP world. So, basically, uh, before you needed to uh, understand how to build a model and then build the model. Right now you can, however, uh, enter the NLP world through the prompt engineering or just prompting in general and you can, I, I, I can see that, however, in the future we will have people that will keep going with the model building and people that will, however, have uh, um, they will add something even if they are not technical. Today, I think the, this is possible 100%. It will be easier, at least. In healthcare, I'm very hopeful. Uh, there's a lot of progress. All the generative models, be in text or image generative models, um, are very promising. I think there's this big capacity of augmenting doctors. So if anyone is thinking, the job is going to disappear. I do not think so. I think there are some specific features of having these big technologies that can remove some burden from doctors, which other technologies fail to do. For example, um, and I'm not going to go into details, but the electronic health re uh, records were supposed to help 
the doctors and then now they become a, a burden. So hopefully those new AI tools will be uh, a better alternative. Uh, the, you know, there's also some leaking and education happening on both ways. So healthcare professionals start having some more AI exposures and some more AI education without them being AI developers. But as long as they're educated, and now I can see the efforts from also the machine learning and uh, AI community, the people who are working on health, health in the healthcare field are trying to reach out more and get more healthcare education as well, um, at least the minimum. So I, I'm very hopeful of seeing these tools being built properly. I, I hope that they are built for everyone. Um, and by everyone, I don't just mean uh, diverse within a country, I also mean uh, for other countries because healthcare is needed everywhere. So this is where I'm hoping all the research will be uh, going for forward. So yeah. All right. So yeah, so what I see, well, what I, li what I like to see right now, what I'm seeing right now that I like is really like on the AI side, uh, I think we're like, we are at a pivotal moment where either we go like, as I said before, like we go Skynet and then you know, we become slaves to AI or we actually like tame it and use it for good. Uh, and it could be, you've mentioned burnout before. There's many things right now, like on my daily job, which is like there's tech, but there's a sales cycle that takes a lot of my time and a lot of juice to actually produce anything that actually helps me do that way more efficient and I, with the right results. So leveraging the tools to also make myself like that I can deal with my time way better, so I feel better about myself. At the end of the week, I'm not as like I'm I'm not fully burned. There's still a, a bit juice left, so I can do go through my weekend and enjoy it. So that piece of tech is really where, uh, and I've seen it like um, you know, Danielle did a, a presentation on you know just like on cost control and things that can happen inside GCP. I've mentioned that around security. There's pieces everywhere, like meds. I think the biggest blocker for doctors was fax. Faxes should go like we're. <laughs> Start, like blockbuster is gone also right so uh, so <laughs> so but that's the thing like we're, we're at that pivotal moment and leveraging those tools for the right reason and properly will actually well I hope will actually help us maybe refocus on ourselves a bit get a breather and uh, you know just hopefully make us better as a uh, as a whole thank you very much um, uh, next question is actually what is your strategy to keep up with this evolving technology since it changes so often in this field? Uh, use it. I mean, the only way to keep current is to use it. Um, I've mentioned like there's like again, like, yeah, if you're using GCP or AWS or Azure, there's there's always a free tier. You don't pay a dime and you can play with stuff. Go in, test it out, leverage any mechanism. Like I'm, we're recorded, but like. You get 300 bucks of Google credits when you sign for an account. Just create a new email address that gives you 600 bucks. <laughs> you know, it's, it's super simple. Like, just go on, and there's there's many levers you can leverage. So just keep on. You just you have to keep up with it. Uh, it's always the same thing. My biggest fear in tech, personally, it's when something comes out and I don't get it. Like, is that the point in time where I actually like just antiquated myself? So go go back and like just wear socks and sandals. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, I guess uh, yeah. Use it is a very good advice. For me, I have a couple of strategies. So go to events like this, small events where new technology is exposed. You'll be aware of like the cool new stuff. Uh, find yourself some good people to follow in different social medias. I have a bunch of people I'm following on Twitter. Um, most of the machine learning community. Migrated to Mastodon for Twitter reasons, but Twitter is still active. You can have um, a couple of podcasts or or some people on LinkedIn who really post about the new niche topic that you like. And then if we're talking about more of a in a professional perspective later, it's going to be either certifications that kind of force you to follow the technology and attending conferences. Um, you have to pick and choose for conferences. Some of them are more of a showcase of industries that I find less interesting. Uh, others are very research heavy, so depending on your different interests, but they're, they're a good way to keep up to date, meet new people, and you know, build your, your network as well. I just wanted to echo, sorry, just wanted to echo something about what we just said about certification. 
like I said, go play with it, have fun with it. A good way to actually test yourself against something, get certified. Um, you'll see if you actually retain any information. Um, I was just going to add, like, I, you know, Stacy mentioned the, the CNCF meetups, um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, a lot of those things are open source and it's cool to see sometimes they're like really deep dives on really specific technologies where you can get lost, but it's also a really interesting place to kind of discover. Um, so like a big kind of foundation like that um, is interesting because there's a lot of different aspects to the technology or different things that, that it does. Um, but I would also say um, learn a little bit about people because that's what I'm here to talk about, but learn about leadership um, and what that looks like. And that might not be the first job you get out of university, but it's something to really be aware of because the difference between a good manager and a bad manager is huge. Um, and it can really, I don't want to say make or break, I, it can make or break your experience. Um, so I would say as much as the technology is important, and it is, of course, but the people side is never going to not be there. So remember that um, how you interact and how you're curious and how you engage with people um, on a human level matters no matter what the job is that you do. Um, well, my usual workflow is uh, basically um, I have a lot of blogs that I can read and people on LinkedIn in general. And then I usually go on Hugging Face, and I try to understand what are the models out there, uh, how they're used, how they have trained, if there are already tutorial, and then I usually go to YouTube to see how people are reacting. Also to understand if that model is uh, used, if, if it is a model that right now is hype, but uh, I will not probably use it in the future. And uh, if you like to read research papers, research papers are a really good way. Uh, with also Google so a Scholar, you can set your alert for your topic of interest and keep going with the, with the learning. Thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, some great advice. Um, in the interest of time, we will skip the student section and go right into Q&A because hopefully they'll merge together and we'll we'll go through the the slido questions uh, some have uh, have piled up but then you can add some more if you want and a a vote on the ones that you want uh, to see the most so all right so the the first question we have here is um have you ever done any teaching slash mentoring related to your field in the past and would you be interested in doing so I can start. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I've done the past. I'm uh, currently doing doing it, and uh, uh, especially with Women Tech Maker. Uh, but I usually work also with other um, non-profit uh, organization here in Montreal, uh, and I've been mentoring people like young from, I think, six years old and people that uh, were uh, 50 years old. So yeah, uh, I'm interested and I will continue because I think uh, every time that I'm, I do some mentoring, it's a learning lesson also for me. Always open to it. Um, always seeking mentors. I don't think that ever changes. Um, and I think for me, it's always been really informal. Um, it's been through, I don't know, just being the first person doing this thing or being the first woman in the company or whatever, you know, it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be like a formal um, setup. Um, so yeah, the answer is yes and keep doing it. <laughs> yes, teaching, I've done both. Um in like a more of structured way and also in positions where the AI department was very new. I felt like some education for the rest of the tech team was very important. So we did lunch and learns where I just exposed them into the basics because we're not building products by ourselves. We need them. So they need to understand what we were doing. And then in terms of mentorship, I have done and yes, open to it as well. 
So yeah, uh, done it twice. We'll definitely keep on doing it. I just love be able to kind of share what I know. And it was really like uh, like tech specific. Uh, last one being, of course, like around, around Google Cloud, but really um, through a Google program in the US of mentorship, being able to be teamed up with someone and uh, just go through, it doesn't have to be tech. It could have been like, how was your week? It's been a crap week, let's talk about it. And then the week after is, hey, by the way, I wanna get my professional architect certifications. Okay, well, let's make it happen. And then let's let's go through the motion and let's talk about what you need to what you need to know. So it's it's great to do that and would and definitely love to do it again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so this question, uh, okay, next question. Um, as professionals, so what are things to do and not to do when approaching professionals for references as a student? <laughs> Things to do. I, I, I don't know. Uh, to ask for, like. Like a reference for if you go to a mm -hmm. company and you need uh, someone you know, but. Maybe yeah, I mean, like, well, yeah, just like reference wise, it's just like things not to do or do. It's like when you're asking for one, you're asking for one for the right reason, and not just because you're plugged in with someone. Yeah. It's like just because, like, yeah, you're, you're backing me up or, or vouching for me because I'm actually good at this, not just because like I paid for lunch like five minutes ago, right? <laughs> so that's, that's the main thing, like do it for the right reason, so that way uh, if you start by getting an interview somewhere because you lied about your, yeah, that's a, like an awful way to start. Mm -hmm. No, I think you said it all. Yeah? <laughs> awesome, so the next question uh, for Huda. Uh, what are some fields slash industries in tech that bring tech to healthcare? So could you talk about some specific like projects that reduce this gap? Some industries that bring tech to healthcare? Yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty much all of them. If we're just talking software, uh, every single aspect of it. Um, one that's close to my heart that I'm very not knowledgeable about is <laughs> security. I think uh, it's super important. Uh, obviously, uh, AI in all the different aspects, uh, be it NLP, image, um, computer vision, image generation. Well, image generation is more of a, still in the research field right now. Uh, but uh, computer vision have been here for a while, uh, already used, uh, being improved in radiology, in pathology, um, in phys physiotherapy as well. Um, Honestly, like every single aspect. So whatever skill you have or you're interested in, want to bring to healthcare, healthcare needs it. Uh, just go for it. Thank you. Um, the one of the uh, next questions is, uh, despite the glass ceiling and the challenges faced by women in tech, what kept you guys going? Uh, what is so attractive about tech? Um. <laughs> Um, it's it's <laughs> it's that it's not everywhere. Uh, there are companies where this is not happening. You just need to be aware that it, it exists so you can look for it. But it's uh, <laughs> thankfully it's not everywhere. And also just this mission for me personally, this mission that I have is maybe bigger than the challengers. So it's still pushing me forward so far. Uh, Yeah. Um, right. Then I think this will be our last question before we close it because I think we're approaching on the, the end of the, uh, the session. Um, would you recommend pursuing a graduate degree in this field? It's very broad. Okay, I'm going to answer with like a bit of an HR hat because I was also in HR. Um, I, and you, everyone, you two will be much more expert in terms of maybe advocating for, for why. I would say it, it depends where, you, where you're working in tech and what you want to do. Um, my experience is really in, you know, like a, a for-profit business. Um, and I think that I would say um, the degree a degree matters because it shows you can learn something. Um, 
when we were hiring, we never actually looked at a master's degree. We, I don't think we ever hired anyone with a PhD. Um, it really came down to how are you with people? <laughs> um, how interested are you in learning new technology? How do you work with others in a team? Um, those things, from my personal experience, uh, I wouldn't say are necessarily more important, but they, they matter a lot. Um, and so from, from my limited experience in hiring, um, it didn't necessarily make a difference, but that shouldn't discourage anyone. I think it really depends on what you want to do with your career. But I think somebody who has a graduate degree should probably answer this question. <laughs> uh, so I think, honestly, uh, you will have your degree if you want to have it, if there are reasons for you to have it, not for other people. Because in, in how can I say, in any case, as, as she said, it will not be 100% your degree that will tell you, okay, you, you will have that job 100%. Uh, there are other skills, and especially, like, you, you can see a job it's really a sort of transaction. Like, you want to learn to have a salary from the job, but you need also to give to that the salary. So you are, it's weird to say in that way, but basically you are useful for that position if you can do what is required, and if you it can go also beyond that. So does, do you need a, a degree for that? Probably yes, probably not, it depends on you. Um, Right now we have so many things that we can learn from, from the internet for free and also during our uh, free time that probably you can also have those skills without a degree. And also don't uh, underestimate the fact that you can have your degree after you landed the job. So if for example you think that again to be a manager you need a master degree, you can do it also after you land a job. So you, you have a lot of time, basically. One point. Um, historically, for machine learning, we would hire someone with a master's just because no one ever did any machine learning in their bachelor curriculum. So we, by default, look for masters or you have equivalent experience because you did some side projects or something. I feel like now curriculums are being updated. I don't know how much. Uh, so, is a master's degree required? I would say no. Um, it can help. Honestly, PhD takes, a, like she said, she's, it's for you because uh, it's mentally draining. It's not like a, you know, it, it is research, it is intense. And then sometimes it could not be helpful because, oh, well, sorry, you're overqualified for that, that job. Um, so, once you're there, look at the market what's required now and then you can judge. And then otherwise go with interest. If you really want to do research and go for PhD or postdoc and stay in academia, then please do because we also need people who stay there. But uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, well, yeah, so I just want to, from someone who doesn't have a PhD, uh, I just have three years of CGEP. That's all I have in tech, that's it. And I'm speaking here right now. So I'll just give you an idea. Uh, it's just a question of skills being at the right place at the right time. Uh, so that's, that's basically it. So your skill set is your key. So keep that in mind. I want to say thank you to our panelists for coming today. It was really nice to hear your uh, like range of experiences and your, your different backgrounds and to kind of gain insight from it. I think everyone here appreciates uh, that, you're, that you're coming here to talk and to give this advice everyone. So uh, yeah, I will, we'll have a kind of, I guess, break now as uh, the next presentation sets up. If any students would like to come up and or yeah. talk to you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.